Good morning. It's Sunday, July 25th, 2021. This is our, our sermon uh, for the day. You uh, can join us live on Facebook or on our website or in our app uh, at Brewster Friends Church. Uh, we encourage you to, to join with us live and worship with us live. But this is if something happens to our live feed or if you just can't can't join us live and just want to watch the sermon. Uh, this is a, this will be available on our YouTube channel and also uh, in our app <clears throat> under the the sermons tab. Um, I want to start today by reading to you from Lamentations four. So we consider some um, some difficult things, problems, struggles in our lives today. Jeremiah writes these words. The parched tongues of their little ones stick to the roofs of their mouths in thirst. The children cry for bread, but no one has any to give them. The people who once ate the richest foods now beg in the streets for anything they can get. Those who once wore the finest clothes now search the garbage dumps for food. Those killed by the sword are better off than those who die of hunger. Starving they waste away for lack of food from the fields. Tender-hearted women have cooked their own children. They have eaten them to survive the siege. Jeremiah describes there a time in Jerusalem where the people are clearly struggling, where they're hurting, where... um, There's pain. He says later on in verse 18 of that chapter, We couldn't go into the streets without danger to our lives. Our end was near. Our days were numbered. We were doomed. I don't know if we've ever truly experienced a time where we felt like we were doomed. Like there there was no hope to survive. But maybe you have. Maybe there's been been times, been moments, been um, been things that have happened where you feel like there is no hope. Now, this scene that Jeremiah describes is from Jeremiah 39. And that's the passage we're going to look at today. We've kind of skipped ahead and, and there's, there's reason for that. But I want to look at this time where where Jeremiah's prophecies come true, where he's warned Israel that um, these things would happen. Now, the the words that are described, both in Lamentations and what we're going to read in Jeremiah, um, describe it a horrific time. But Jeremiah told them it would happen. And throughout Jeremiah before this, God has, through Jeremiah, has told his people that disaster would come from the north, that a strange foreign nation would attack them, that Jerusalem would be surrounded and besieged, that there would be a famine, that the land would be laid to waste, that the kingdoms would be torn down, that death would enter Jerusalem, that kings would, would set up thrones at the, the gates of their city, that the great city of Jerusalem would be reduced to ashes, that people would be taken away as prisoners. We see this come to fruition in Jeremiah 39. In his description of enduring this, is we were doomed. His armies battered down their protective walls. They lost hope. They watched each other die of, of starvation. Every day was met with more hopelessness and oppression and pain. And while we've may not literally felt another nation come and threaten us like that, we've all felt besieged at some point in our life. We've all felt surrounded and, and overwhelmed and starved. Maybe our hearts, maybe through through pain and loss and grief. Maybe you're there today. Maybe you feel under attack today. Maybe you feel surrounded today. Maybe you feel overwhelmed today. Because the brokenness and pain and injustice and oppression and death in this world are overwhelming you. These things break down the protective barriers that we've built. They destroy what we thought would keep us safe. We lose hope. We feel doomed. When we watch someone we, we love slowly die, we feel doomed. 
when we can't pay the bills, when the debt's mounting, we feel doomed. When we're stuck in the job or relationship or problem that's just draining our souls, it saps our energy, it steals our purpose and joy, we feel doomed. A week ago, one of the the members of our church's two-year-old grandson died. Things like that happen. Where where's hope? How do we feel anything but but doom and dread? That's when we experience the starvation that Jeremiah describes. Not a literal starving, but but a spiritual, emotional, soul starvation. It's a slow death, painful, prolonged suffering that isn't going anywhere. And Jeremiah proclaimed in those words and lamentations that the people who were getting stabbed were the lucky ones. The people who, who it just ended and they didn't have to endure this, they had it better off. And you might feel that way in life right now. And if you feel doomed this morning, I want to encourage you today that in this story of hopelessness and pain and death, that hope can be found. The yes, sorrow is real, and we can't ignore it or pretend that it isn't there. But I want you to hear today why you don't have to feel doomed any longer. But let's start looking in, in Jeremiah chapter 39. And this is not Jeremiah's description of his emotions and what they're going through but a description historically of what's happening here um, and is causing all this pain. So let's start with what's happening and talk about the points of sorrow that are there before we see the hope that God provides them. Jeremiah 39 verse 1 says, In January of the ninth year of King Zedekiah's reign, King Nebuchadnezzar came with his army to besiege Jerusalem. Two and a half years later, on July 18th, in the 11th year of King Zedekiah's reign, the Babylonians broke through the wall and the city fell. All the officers of the Babylonian army came in and sat in triumph at the middle gate. Nergal Sherezer of Samgar, the Nabo uh, Sarsakum, a chief officer, and Nergal Sherezer, the king's advisor, and all the other officials. When King Zedekiah and all the soldiers saw the Babylonians had broken into the city, they fled. They waited for nightfall and then slipped through the gate between the two walls behind the king's garden and headed toward the Jordan Valley. But the Babylonian troops chased the king and caught him on the plains of Jericho. They took him to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who was at Riblah in the land of Hamath. There the king of Babylon pronounced judgment upon Zedekiah. He made Zedekiah watch as they slaughtered his sons and all the nobles of Judah. Then they gouged out Zedekiah's eyes, bound him in bronze chains, and led him away to Babylon. Meanwhile, the Babylonians burned Jerusalem, including the palace, and tore down the walls of the city. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the the captain of the guard, I'm sorry, then Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, sent to Babylon the rest of the people who remained in the city, as well as those who had defected to him. Now, between this and Lamentations, these are absolutely brutal passages to read. They're not the stories of Nebuchadnezzar that we tell our kids in Sunday school. They illustrate how powerful and vengeful and brutal that he was. And now, we have not built up to this. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of flashback. We're seeing the end here. And, and we'll go back to see the story of, of how they got to this point. <clears throat> but King Zedekiah... <clears throat> pardon me. King Zedekiah had a choice to live as a subject to Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon, or to die, and that's a choice he was given, and Jeremiah warned him of what would come, but Zedekiah was not willing to become what we'd call a vassal state, he wasn't willing to to serve Nebuchadnezzar, and he didn't do what Nebuchadnezzar demanded that he did, so Nebuchadnezzar came and and wiped him out. We believe it was 18 or 19 months, Nebuchadnezzar's army surrounded Jerusalem, cut it off from the world. Uh, and the hunger that Jeremiah was lamenting was because of this siege, because of the city being surrounded. No one thought the walls would fall down, except Jeremiah who prophesied it. 
and they did. They fell. Lamentations um, describes what those soldiers did in Jerusalem. Buildings were destroyed. The temple was plundered and decimated. Princes were hung by their hands in the streets. Women were, were raped in front of their families. The elderly were abused. For a month, these armies committed every atrocity they could to these people. And then whoever was, was left, they took away. They exiled them to Babylon. They chained them up and they marched them away from their home. And they made the Israelites slaves once again. Zedekiah, who was the real source of the rebellion against Babylon, was treated, we see here, with contempt. Um, Ezekiel prophesied um, in a prophecy that didn't make sense to the people until it happened. That Zedekiah would be taken to Babylon, but he would never see it. People said, how, how would that be? Well, we see what happens here. Um, they allowed him to keep his sight long enough to watch his sons be murdered in front of him, and then they gouged out his eyes. And then they enslaved him. They took him to Babylon, but he never saw it. Uh, and then they destroyed the city. They tore it down. They tore down the temple. They tore down the homes. They, they tore down everything and burned it. Now we look at this and say, what can we possibly learn from this, this terrible devastation and hearing this, the, the pain and sorrow that <clears throat> these people had to go through? Well, there's some lessons in sorrow here. Not all the lessons, not extensive lessons, but the lessons for us to think about in the midst of our sorrows. Number one, they knew it was coming. They should have known it was coming. Jeremiah told them it was coming. Didn't tell them when, but told them it was coming. And <clears throat> we don't see sorrow coming. But at the same time, God has told us that we'll experience hard things. We may not have a prophecy of the exact things that will happen, but at the same time, we are, we are told that in this world we'll have troubles. And we should never be surprised that bad things happen in a broken world. We should never be surprised that we have to experience pain and suffering. God's people here acted surprised as if, as if they didn't know this was coming, but God told them. Life is hard and this world is broken and those things should never surprise us. They hurt us, they bring pain, but we should never step back and be surprised that horrific things happen because we don't we live in this world that's been that's been broken and and painful, hard, difficult things are are going to happen throughout our lives. Number 2 we, we see a lesson that this was the consequence of a series of, of actions and choices. Whether it was the actions and choices of the people to worship other gods, whether it was the action of the choices of Zedekiah to, to be in rebellion, we can often draw a pretty straight line from suffering and hardship that we see in the people who are suffering. Um, someone who smoked for 50 years, shouldn't ask God why he would let them get lung cancer. We There's a constant series of choices and actions that, that led to that. And there are times where there are people like King Zedekiah who have directly sinned against God, and these are consequences of their sins. There's a series of actions that have led to where we're at. You know, if you, you make choices in your relationships in your marriage with your kids that uh, that break that relationship we shouldn't be surprised when it's broken however the third lesson not everybody who suffered sin we can't look at jerusalem and say everybody who suffered was responsible for that although they were all a part of this nation that chose to rebel against god not everybody who lived there rebelled against god Take Jeremiah, for example, who suffers during this time. He is not directly responsible. He's the opposite. He starved right alongside the people. He stuff, suffered even though he was a, the saint, not the sinner. Sometimes the reason we suffer comes back to us. Sometimes it's our fault. Sometimes it's our choices. And sometimes it isn't. 
Sometimes it has nothing to do with us. Perhaps it's it's somebody else's choices that led us, and sometimes it's just because the world is broken. And there are innocent collateral damages to sin and brokenness. And sometimes we're among it. We search for a reason for our pain, and sometimes there is none. Fourth, and finally, what we learn from suffering is up to us. You know, what the people did with this time, with this prolonged suffering. I mean, could you imagine living 19 months in a city that never got a food delivery, that didn't have crops, where you watched children starve in the, in the streets, or as Jeremiah describes, women boiling their own children for food. What we've all experienced is that pain and suffering change us. They move something in us. And we adapt our lives because of it. And those changes can be positive and they can be negative. Much of the Old Testament is written in response to these passages. It is written in response to the exile that happens and the, and the atrocities committed leading into that exile, and, and the hope people are searching for in the midst of, of this devastation. Some of the people responded by learning to hate. Uh, they hated Babylon. They, they wanted to destroy them. Psalm 137, we see this prayer of the psalmist writing how happy that, that some would be to bash the heads of Babylon's children on a rock. That's it's not quite the response that I, I don't think that God would want, but sometimes that's what happens. We, we, we blame someone. We look for someone to hate, someone to be angry at. Some learn to ask questions. Um, and the Psalms are filled with questions from, from times like this. It, it, where are you, Lord? Why? When will you respond? Why aren't you listening? Um, are, you, are you here? Have you abandoned us? Have you forgotten us? These are actually forms of prayer that we would call lament. We cry out in our pain, asking questions, looking for explanations. And, and that's okay. It's okay to ask questions of God. God's not afraid of our questions. And it's only when we ask questions that we, we find answers. So perhaps our pain um, pushes us deeper to ask questions and, and seek more truth. As long as we're willing to listen to the answers to the questions then it's okay to ask. But some of them learn to be patient. Through their pain, they learn patience and perseverance and long-suffering. They waited. But what were they waiting for? They were waiting for God. Because they didn't believe that this suffering would have the last word. They did not believe the Babylonians were the final answer. They waited and God answered. How did God answer? He answered with Jesus. He answered with the cross. He answered by experiencing all the same kind of pain and suffering that all those people were enduring. He, he answered by crying out for the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just like these people in Jerusalem were. He answered them with an empty tomb. He answered with victory. Suffering didn't have the last word in Jerusalem. Suffering didn't have the last word with Jesus. And suffering does not have the last word in your life either. So as we read these terrible passages, how can we find hope in the midst of the suffering? Move forward and look. Verse 10. But Nabuzardan left a few of the poorest people in Judah, and he assigned them vineyards and fields to care for may not seem like a significant passage, but what it says is this. Practically speaking, Nebuchadnezzar was leaving people behind to make money off of Judah. They have vineyards, we need grapes, that's, that's used this as a part of our economy. The whole reason he wanted to be a vassal state was to further Babylon's money-making efforts. 
But what we, we recognize is that God was leaving a remnant in Jerusalem. God was, was leaving people to rebuild. Not everyone was taken. It, it may have just been a few poor farmers, but a few poor farmers is all God needs. And as people who were being changed and mar- chained and marched away to their homes, there was this ember of hope left burning in them. There was a chance for the flame of Israel to be ignited. And what I want you to hear today is not that the walls of Jerusalem were torn down, but the, the walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt. That we we have books of the Bible. Nehemiah comes back and restores this. Uh, Ezra comes back and, and rebuilds the temple. In the midst of destruction, there's also this hope of restoration. That even though these things were torn down for a reason, that even though it's because of all these actions and things that happened, that God left a remnant there to rebuild. And that while you may feel like you've lost everything in life, I promise you that there's something, even if it's just the ashes of your life left, that even with that, God can bring beauty. That God can rebuild, that God can restore. There's hope, not that that we can do something, but there's hope that God can do something even with the brokenness that's left behind in our lives. Verse 11, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar had told Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, to find Jeremiah. See that he isn't hurt, he said. Look after him well and give him everything he wants. So Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, Nebuchadnezzar, a chief officer, Nergal Zarazar, the king's advisor, and all the, the other officers of Babylon's king, sent messengers to bring Jeremiah out of the prison. They put him under the, cave, under the care of Gedaliah, son of Ahakam, and the grandson of Zaphon, and who, who took him back to his home. So Jeremiah stayed in Judah among his own people. First of all, I butchered all those names, I'm sure. But, but the important part of that passage is this. Uh, we'd see before that Jeremiah was in a pit. He's in prison, basically. He's punished for trying to get the people to listen to God's word. He's punished for telling them this destruction's coming, and all the other frost prophets are saying, no, it's not. Stop stop listening to him. And as Jeremiah sat in that pit, as Jeremiah then endured everything that happened in Jerusalem, he had to feel forgotten, neglected, as if life, all that he had done in his life was wasted. I mean, imagine... Spending your life warning of people, get ready, this this destruction's coming, um, change or it's going to come, and then you have to watch as the destruction comes and, and know that they didn't listen to you. But God had not forgotten Jeremiah. And we see Jeremiah be rescued. Um, he's not exiled as the others are. or God had other prophets and people that he would use in the exile. But he left Jeremiah behind to be with his own people, to give, continue to give God's word. And now, there's more pain than problem coming. The suffering isn't over. There's more bad decisions that lead to more bad things. And Jeremiah has to flee Jerusalem eventually. But, but the hope that we see in this passage is that when we are locked in that prison of suffering and pain, when we're down in that pit of our despair, watching the world fall apart around us, God has not forgotten you. He has not left you there on your own. That will lift you up out of that pit and restore you. Verse 15 says, The Lord had given the following message to Jeremiah while he was still in prison. Say to Abedmelech the Ethiopian, This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says, I will do this to this I will do to this city everything I've threatened. I will send disaster, not prosperity. You will see its destruction, but I will rescue you from those who fear you so much. Because you trust in me, I will give you your life as a reward. I will rescue you and keep you safe. I, the Lord, have spoken. So these are the words. God's still using Jeremiah. He still is giving him messages, even in this pit. And he wants him to speak to this slave. We're told he's an Ethiopian. He's a Gentile. Uh, and this uh, abed uh, Malek had tried to help Jeremiah, tried to rescue him previously. And so here God wants to speak truth in, into the life of abed Malek. And the truth is that he's going to rescue him. I'm going to keep you safe. All these terrible things are going to happen, and yet God was still there, and God was still working. 
Isn't it amazing that in the midst of this whole city falling down, that God has a message for just one person? That God wants Jeremiah, I want you to go to this one person and say to them that you'll be saved because you've trusted in God. As the world is falling apart around you, that if you just trust in me, I will rescue you. I will keep you safe. In spite of everything going on around him, in spite of the fact that he's a slave, that, that he's a foreigner, that he doesn't even fit in this place to begin with, and now he has to endure the suffering going on around it, he still trusted in God. Do you trust in God in the midst of everything going on in life around you? Because it's that trust that will save you. It's that trust that will rescue you. It's that trust that will, that will cause you to cling to him. And that will keep you safe. That will bring you hope. I want you to hear the promises in this passage today. That God, we see God destroy, but God restores. We see brokenness and pain, but God heals. We see people feel alone, but God is still there. And God has not abandoned them. We see people without hope, but God gives them a way out. God rescues them and saves them. And I don't know what the path to restoration and hope and rescue is in your life, but I know that God is there. And I know that God provides. And I know that God has, has given His Son to show you that you are not alone in your pain. This past week, I was at our yearly meeting, our annual conference for the uh, Evangelical French Church Eastern Region. And our speaker was a man named Jeremiah Johnston, uh, who runs ChristianThinkers.org. <clears throat> and um, but one day he was talking about his sister, who had um, was 25 weeks pregnant just a few weeks before he was speaking, and um, had lost their baby. <clears throat> and in that story, he started talking about them mourning Wesley Vance. And that caused the story to really jump out at me because that's my son, my oldest son's name. And um, so this miscarriage of Wesley Vance suddenly, you know, caused me, as, as I don't know about you, but when I hear stories like that, and especially that name jumps out, it makes you start to feel, you know, how I would feel if I lost my son. I, I empathize even more so. Then he talked about a letter that his sister had written and how she had had hope in the midst of, of her pain and suffering. And she had written in that letter that she took hope because she knew that the first time that Wesley Vance opened his eyes, he saw Jesus. These are words that I have spoken in a different way, at funerals, in times of pain. And it's this great reminder that no matter what we're experiencing in life, Jesus is there. That we have to view every matter of pain and suffering in our lives through the lens of the cross. Because what's happening in Jerusalem doesn't make sense to Jeremiah, but suddenly through the lens of the cross, we begin to see how God is using it to bring hope. The cross is what helps us make sense of it all, not just in Jeremiah, but in our lives. The cross gives us a reason to hope that the pain and suffering don't have the final say. The cross gives us a reason to trust that, that God is fighting for us. The cross gives us reason to believe that there is victory over all this because the cross is not the end of the story. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the suffering, at the end of the pain, at the end of life, when we open our eyes, we'll see Jesus. He'll write the end of our story. And you'll be better off for having been a part of his story. I don't know what pain you bring here today. But I know that God brings the promise of restoration. Perhaps you feel lonely and lost and stuck in that pit. Was that hope that God is there with you? That'll lift you up 
out of the muck and mire of this life and put your feet on solid rock. Perhaps you feel starved today. But God promises that he is the living water who quenches every thirst, that he is the bread of life. And you never have to feel that hunger again when we trust in him. Perhaps you feel that brokenness. Like your, like your life is, is a pile of ashes, but God promises to bring beauty from our ashes. God promises to restore what's broken. Your pain, your suffering, your problems are very real. And perhaps they're from choices you're made and perhaps they're not. But either way, no matter where the pain comes from, no matter whether it makes sense or it doesn't, God is there. God is with you. God is for you. And the promise of a cross and an empty tomb says that you will have victory over these things in Christ Jesus if you trust in Him to bring you the restoration in life that only He can bring. Father God, I pray for those today who are struggling, who are in pain, who are hurting, and we ask today that in, in their pit, in their pile of ashes, in, the, in their suffering and their pain, and all those things in their hearts that are, that are just broken, we ask that they would see and feel your presence. That they would find just a glimmer of hope in you. That they would see your light in the midst of their darkness. That they would be reminded that their pain does not have the final say in their lives. The cross has the final say. Your pain has the final say. And you overcame that pain. You showed us that no pain in this world, no suffering in this life is greater than you. May we cling to that hope today. We pray all these things and cling to these promises of hope today. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen and amen.